Good evening, everyone. Welcome to 2018 and the first meeting of the year, at least the first board meeting of the year. Um, this is the Education Committee. It is January 3rd. Um, we will skip announcements. Um, and if we need to, we'll go back to them later. So tonight we have uh, a number of presentations. Um, oh, we also have minutes. So any corrections to the minutes, let Brooke know. Um, so I will turn the next portion of the meeting with the presentations over to Mrs. Morrison, who can introduce the various presentations. Good evening, and thank you, Dr. Ludwig. We have several presentations regarding secondary curriculum this evening. Our departments have been hard at work over the last um, four years developing a backward design approach to curriculum. Um, this evening, our social studies coordinator for grade 6 to 12, Mr. Tony Gianmarco, is going to give an update on his subject area, followed by our grade 6 to 12 English language arts coordinator, Mrs. Brenda Vanderwick. Mr. Gianmarco. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the Education Committee and everyone in attendance for providing me this opportunity to uh, share with you all um, all things social studies at the secondary <coughs> level. Um, as Ava mentioned already, we, we have been working pretty hard, um, I think for the last three or four years, um, uh, revamping our curriculum, our secondary curriculum. Um, I, I've only been involved in this process directly as a coordinator for, for really the last two years. Um, but it's been going on for a while now. So um, our, our mission statement and our vision statement are, are fairly simple, but I think they're um, powerful ones. I'm not going to read them uh, to you, but uh, what I do want to highlight uh, in regard to the mission statement would be um, two things. Uh, one is uh, that we're providing students with a comprehensive study of history and two, that we're doing that through multiple perspectives. And um, I think that becomes a bit more powerful and clear with, with this visual. So this is what the curricular progression looks like at the secondary level. We got two um, bands of, of history. Uh, everything you see in red uh, represents uh, world history, and everything you see in blue represents US history or American history. And uh, what I really like about where we are currently is, is as you move uh, from 6 to 12, um, there are no longer uh, any, any gaps um, in, uh, in history. Uh, it is, at this point, complete. It is comprehensive. Uh, we move uh, through ancient history and medieval history in 6th and 7th grade. Um, in 8th grade, we transition to American history. B-A-R stands for uh, Birth of the American Republic. You'll see that in a later slide. RMA stands for uh, Rise of Modern America. Again, you'll see that in the later slide. Um, at that point, we're in modern history. We, we, we moved to uh, contemporary American government, 10th grade, uh, still uh, in, in US history. Um, and then we double back um, from a world history perspective. So that really affords us the opportunity to uh, provide students with that comprehensive study of history uh, through really multiple lenses, multiple perspectives, uh, both with, within the subject matter and also without. So for instance, um, something like the Vietnam War can be studied in 10th grade from an American perspective. And then again in 12th grade, students are going to learn about the Vietnam War, but this time from a Vietnamese perspective, I think it would be very powerful. Um, so that, that's something I'm, I'm, I'm pretty excited about. I'm proud of that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we were there a few years ago, but we are now. Um, so I did want to highlight that. Um, so in regard to, to the units, this is what sixth grade looks like. Um, the, the big idea, the overarching theme, uh, is that um, uh, students are learning about um, what makes a civilization. And um, you know, we're, we're looking at those traits um, through ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and India. Um, so that's really the sixth grade focus. In seventh grade, um, we're still uh, discussing world history, but now we're looking at 
the empires of uh, medieval history and uh, the legacies, the contributions that they've made to history and also our world today. Um, one, one clear example would be uh, you know, the, the Romans really established uh, kind of republicanism, uh, the concept of republicanism, and, and obviously that there's a clear connection between uh, that and, and our system of government today, and that's something that we would highlight to students and help them understand. Um, eighth grade is when we transition to U.S. or American history. Um, and, and really the focus, the big idea, is, is sort of the evolution of America from really a collection of colonial outposts to uh, a nation state that spans the continent. It's not a, that was not an easy um, evolution. It wasn't uh, smooth, but that's really the focus. In ninth grade, uh, we're looking at the emergence of the United States as a world power. Um, and, and some of the, the you know, some of the debates within this country about that emergence. Um, if if you're paying close attention, as you can see, in I'm just going to double back here. Sorry, in um, eighth and ninth grade, um, we tend to sort of narrow our focus, and that's done intentionally to ease that transition for a student who's moving from the middle school to the high school setting. Um, you know, we're staying within U.S. history. Um, and I think that just makes for uh, an easier transition uh, for someone who's, who's moving from that you know, middle school, well, middle school expectations to high school expectations. Um, so now, after uh, ninth grade, uh, tenth grade, um, the focus is, is uh, ultimately um, America as a superpower, both sort of the pros and cons. Um, we do have a capstone unit uh, focusing on American government. Um, initially, uh, I liked that unit at the end um, of the curriculum, uh, but the teachers who, who designed this, uh, this curriculum made a good point. They, they thought that it was very powerful to be at the beginning of the curriculum to coincide with presidential elections and, and make that experience um, a bit more real and exciting for students. So um, right now, it's, it's at the beginning of the curriculum. Um, if at some point the state makes a, a mandated civics exam, um, we could always move that capstone unit to the end of the curriculum to sort of better prepare students for that eventuality, but that's yet to be determined. Um, so at this point, in 11th grade, we're now doubling back and, and we're looking at modern history, but from a non-American or world perspective. Um, the, the focus of 11th grade is, is really in the title, World in Transition, Changing World. A world that is isolated in many ways around the year 1400, and by 1945, a world that is very interconnected. And again, there's pros and cons to that. Um, in 12th grade, and, and this is really, um, I guess, what is most in, in, in flux. Um, uh, the, the, the courses 6 through 11 are more or less set. Uh, we're always tinkering and reviewing the curriculum. But 12th grade, we're, we're currently you know, creating new courses. Uh, right now, in 12th grade, uh, students have uh, no options. They are, they are required to take U.S. government. Um, what we've done is we've um, essentially condensed U.S. government into that capstone unit in 10th grade, um, realizing that uh, U.S. government is always being discussed and always being taught um, in 8th and 9th grade uh, related to history. Um, so that, that affords us a little bit of freedom in 12th grade uh, to now offer students some choice. Uh, so uh, if, if students are really into political science, they really like that, that capstone unit on uh, US government, they can take the politics of today's world, which is a comparative government course. So they're going to apply their knowledge of US government uh, to other governments around the world. It's really modeled after the, um, the AP comparative government course. Um, if students are more interested in traditional history class, um, they can take the Cold War to the War on Terror, which is a contemporary world history class, uh, which uh, sort of covers events from 1945 to the present. Um, that was a bit of a weakness uh, in, in our secondary curriculum um, a few years ago. A, a lot of the most current world history events were, were never discussed because we, we simply ran out of time. And, and now that's, well, next year, um, that will no longer be the case. Um, I, I think that's really powerful for students. I mean. Um, a, a student years ago leaving the high school, um, you know, uh, discussed Africa when it was really a, a collection of European colonies. Well, today it's a collection of independent nation states. Um, they're going to learn about that process 
in 12th grade now, um, where in years past that was sort of neglected. So I think that is, that is again, getting back to that multiple perspectives concept that would be very, very good for students. Um, uh, so in, in addition to those mandated or mandatory courses, we have um, various AP courses and electives that students can take. Um, in 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, we have AP courses that, that can be taken in lieu of those other courses that I mentioned. And then in addition to that, in that second box, those are pure electives that students can take in addition to those man, uh, mandatory <coughs> courses. So if you're crazy about social studies, you can double up and take um, uh, some electives that we offer. Um, so that is really uh, kind of where we stand in social studies at the moment. Um, questions, comments? Thank you. Um, are there questions from the committee? Sure, I just have one. Uh, I guess two questions. Sure. Um, First off is, uh, in regards to the African American history on the last slide, in regards to what you guys have been offering as electives, mm -hmm. uh, I really appreciate that's there, especially in light of all the equity nexus work that we've been doing. Mm -hmm. Has there um, been any thought in regards to also some of the other representations in terms of how that gets woven through in terms of the history curriculum, and for example, the Asian American histories as well? Right, so at, at the moment, we, we don't have, um, let's say, standalone courses that would deal with Asian American history. Um, but uh, that perspective would be, like you said, interwoven in, um, in various courses. So to give you an example, um, when in 10th grade we're discussing the Second World War, uh, there would obviously be a lot of attention uh, given to the experience of Japanese Americans in, in various internment camps and things like that. Um, you know, later on, um, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, in, in 12th grade, the, the, the hope is that we can um, re revisit events from American history, like the Cold War, but from this non-American perspective, which would bring, bring in maybe the Korean perspective about the Korean War, as opposed to just America's experience in Korea. Um, so those are some examples of, of how we would sort of uh, weave in uh, those multiple perspectives. say right now um, in 10th grade we have uh, two section 10th grade is, is a relatively small uh, class but uh, we have two sections of AP US history um, I want to say around 25 students each so we're talking 50 students out of close to 300 so those 250 students are uh, taking either uh, contemporary American government at the honors or academic level and the split there is probably like 60 40, 60 in, in honors, 60% in honors, 40% in, in academic. It would be my guess uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, though. Just to get a ballpark. Mm -hmm. And then how does that go? That number stays, I think, pretty consistent. Those students tend to, tend, not always, follow that track as they progress. Um, in junior year, it grows a little bit uh, because you have, some, you have two options for AP, and, and sometimes that draws more students. Um, and then, for whatever reason, senior year, sometimes students back away from AP. Um, but generally, that it's, there's about two sections, three sections every year. And to what extent is there an integration between the history course and maybe an English course mm -hmm. or something like that? Is any of that happening? And maybe it comes up in Next yeah, and so that's something that we've discussed. Um, right now in 11th grade, uh, the, 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 the course is um, world literature, right? which tends to naturally um, blend with a world history course. Um, but Bria and I, and, and she can speak more to this um, in, in maybe her presentation, but we have um, some, some plans once I think things are settled from a curricular perspective in, in 11th grade. Uh, to 
close, more closely connect those two uh, subject areas. Uh, they're, they're trying out some new novels, I believe, um, which we think can, can connect very nicely to the curriculum, but it's uh, very new for English. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, is the, the one unit in what you referred to as government, is that sufficient to meet the requirements of civics if that becomes a requirement? Um, it's, it's, so this is what we're, we're talking about here. That's a little bit um, misleading. Uh, the way the 10th grade team decided to sort of design uh, their, their curriculum, they're calling Foundations of American Government a unit. Uh, it's, it's really uh, three <coughs> sort of subunits in one. It's, it's essentially a marking period. So it's one fourth of a school year, okay. um, coupled with, again, um, uh, you know, the, the, the knowledge gained in eighth and ninth grade uh, regarding U.S. government that really can't be uh, neglected when you're teaching U.S. history. Uh, my other question has to do with um, over the last few years when we talked about high school restructuring, we uh, discussed how we were going to reduce the tracks in social studies, English, and science uh, for, tenth and, for ninth and 10th grade and then in 11th and 12th provide some options to allow students to take courses that kind of met their interests and needs. Uh, I mean, I see in the program of studies that that's not the case, and I wondered if you could address that. If, if not, why not? And if, if I'm mistaken, how are you addressing that? So that's, uh, to be honest, a, a difficult question for, for me to answer probably alone. Um, there are, I guess, various forces uh, that, that, that are outside of uh, social studies um, that, that ultimately uh, sort of led to where we are. Um, so in, in ninth and tenth grade, uh, we have um, this course offered, uh, those courses offered at the honors and academic level. Um, in eleventh grade and twelfth grade, um, we have on paper in the program of studies um, those courses offered at the honors academic two and academic three level. Um, it, the, I don't know what the number of, of students will be who will, will ultimately. Um, choose to take or be um, recommended to take the academic three level um, based on sort of their performance right now in 10th grade. Um, I, I think organically uh, there is a possibility that we will not have uh, uh, an academic three next year. We may have a, a, a group of students who feels like they need a little more support and would therefore elect to take that level. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to play out, to be quite honest. Um, that's kind of where we are in social studies. I guess I, I just want to pursue it a little bit more because, mm -hmm. I mean, I thought, you know, our whole philosophy was to get away from that. Um, if we are not, I mean, I thought, you know, we were going to come up with courses that had different names, even if they really were addressing, uh, you know, providing the opportunity for people who needed a little more hand-holding to take those courses, but it would be probably clear from the description um, which courses those were. So, I don't know if you could okay. complete that discussion. Sure. Um, I think I can, in part, answer your uh, question. So when, and um, Mr. Gianmarco can provide further details when uh, the Social Studies Department um, underwent their review um, through surveying teachers and students in that department, teachers um, in the department and high school students, one of the um, things that both our high school English and Social Studies Departments feel very strongly about is that students um, are well versed in certain topics and those topics take them through the end of 11th grade where in social studies it's world history and in English it's world literature and after much conversation both departments have determined that if there were choice in 11th grade our students wouldn't get a full complement 
of history or literature that they feel is really, really important. Uh, social studies is a year ahead in their backward design. Um, they don't have a keystone, um, so English um, spend more time and attention working towards the keystone in 10th grade. Um, so for, if you can take a look at the 12th grade course, I think that's what we're talking about. And so um, they have provided opportunities for choice. Uh, students will be making those choices for next year for 12th grade, um, but that was not the case for 11th grade. In terms of discussions around academic levels uh, two and three, um, I think that's something that could be under further review, um, but I, uh, there's also a consideration for supports for students, um, particularly in English, but also in social studies, and I think Ms. Vandergrift will address that a little bit more, that we're asking students who are coming out of, in many cases, co-taught 10th grade classes, and to just release them into an 11th grade academic mm -hmm. two class without any supports in place might not be uh, the best solution. Um, and then again, for 12th grade, we do have the option. Uh, interestingly, um, under the politics of today's world versus the Cold War to the War on Terror, um, <coughs> we can't make a determination of what level that course might be taught at. We're gonna have to wait and see what, this, what the students select and in what capacity. Uh, thank you. Maybe we'll bring it up again after the next presentation, if you don't mind. Um, before you go, though, is, does anyone else on the board have questions or comments? Mr. Storrett. It looks like in the core curriculum that, um, and maybe, it, and maybe Mrs. Morrison just answered this, but it's very much about social studies as history. Yes. And um, is that driven largely by standards, or is that is that a choice? Uh, it, it's part. Well, it's it's partially driven by um, <coughs> by standards. Uh, now, w within these history courses, um, for example, uh, in in sixth grade, uh, there is an emphasis on geography as well, which is a discipline of social studies. Um, in eighth, ninth, and tenth grade, uh, there is a focus on, as I mentioned before, uh, U.S. government in addition to the U.S. history piece, uh, which is another discipline. And then um, uh, our electives really sort of address some of those other disciplines like psychology, um, like economics. Um, you know, I, I, I think uh, also with a, from a kind of social department uh, perspective, um, and I think it sort of mentioned this already, uh, we, we do really believe to, to provide students with that sort of comprehensive study of the history really of us, of man, um, is important uh, for every student. And then if they have interest in a micro or macroeconomics, they have that option as an elective. Um, so that, that's sort of, sort of where, we're, where we are pretty early. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, quick question about, maybe a little bit, taking Mark's question a little bit further. Um, we had a great experience at Janet Town in mm -hmm. fifth grade with uh, one of the teachers weaving into my son's courses a lot of current events. Um, again, kind of, I know we're looking a lot at history, but yeah. where is that getting woven into the curriculum? Um, I think that happens uh, pretty much in, in, in every course naturally. If, if something current event wise is very important, I think it will be discussed. I don't think anyone is um, beholden to the content to the point where they, they can't veer off track on, on any given day. Um, so I think it happens uh, in every course naturally, but um, I think where you're going to see that um, probably most significantly would, would be in those 12th grade uh, course options since they are very contemporary, very current. Um, years ago we had a current world elective, which is essentially a current events class. Again, this was before my time as, as coordinator, and sort of just withered on the vine and died away. But um, I, I think uh, current events would be um, a, a pretty significant portion of those 12th grade course options. Uh, seeing no other questions, uh, thank you. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Ms. Brenda Vandergrift is going to discuss our English language arts um, grade 6 to 12 curriculum. Good evening. Um, thank you for 
coming to listen and uh, ask questions. I think hopefully I will address a lot of the questions that were just asked here, and I know at the end there'll, there'll be more. Um, so let me just start. And when I get into the 11th grade and throughout, I'll, I'll also address the historical aspects. Um, one of the things that we've, uh, we've learned, or I've learned as an English teacher, especially when I came to the high school, I, I taught at the middle school for 17 years, and then when I came to the high school, the one thing that I realized I was, I, I had some um, work to do on was learning the history. So when I'm teaching, what we're teaching the literature, we have to learn the history, and the history has to be taught with it. So it naturally integrates with that. So when I get into some of those sections, I'll be able to address that. Um, we have been working on backwards design probably five years. The English department did start a little bit earlier. We tackled it earlier. It was um, intimidating, um, but then once we had a grasp of what it was all about, um, it became extremely meaningful to us, and everything that we do when we are planning and backwards designing revolves around this vision and this mission. Um, and essentially, obviously, we have to develop the skills that from the PA core. Um, but we're looking to develop them, strengthen them, refine them. Um, we want the essential skills for communication. So that includes reading, writing, listening. Not everyone's a great listener, so we try to teach them to listen, respect, and have that strong form of communication. Um, we also, at the core of almost everything we do, and these are in the conversations that I have with teachers every day, is the concept of, of trying to help our students learn how to become sophisticated thinkers. And we do this through uh, the middle school, through a writing-based curriculum, and then in the high school through a literature-based curriculum. But all of the skills are being developed and honed and, and definitely growing throughout those times. Um, teaching a student to be a sophisticated thinker, um, and that's a, that's a huge word, that's a broad word, but it, it requires us to, to, to encourage them to question, to explore, to analyze, to think, to synthesize. Um, so every, when we're designing these curriculums, we're constantly thinking about those things. Um, the, uh, the language arts program is developed to, so that's the sex thing, I'm sorry. Um, advance the student confidence in the PA core, and um, the most challenging part, I think, as an English teacher, is that we want to nurture a positive attitude towards these. And I will, I, I'm gonna be honest and say to you, when I, my first 20 years of teaching, this was a challenge, uh, more of a challenge than it is now. And what backwards design has allowed us to do is think more deeply about education and about English. So we no longer teach English. We no longer just teach the book. We used to have eight to 10 books in the honors curriculum. <clears throat> So we were just covering literature. So if we throw 10 books at a student, they're gonna naturally, going to naturally become a better reader and a better thinker. Well, no, that doesn't make sense. So we've literally cut that you know, down to five to six pieces of works in different project-based learning um, experiences. And what I found is, through the backwards design, is creating big ideas and essential questions um, and asking students to apply those and connect those to the modern day has totally changed um, the way that students are learning, the way that I'm teaching, the way that they're thinking, and the way that they're excited about what we're doing. So having a positive attitude about reading and using language and writing is not an easy thing to encourage, to develop in a student. But I, I do believe that what we've done here and what you're going to see um, has made a difference. And I can talk a little bit, right now I'm teaching 12th grade, but I can talk a little bit more specifically to 11th and 12th grade, which I, which I teach. Um, so obviously we do this through rigor and through best practice, um, and I'll address some of those as we go along. So as I said earlier, the middle school is based on a writing-based curriculum, and what that means is uh, students study smaller pieces of whatever genre it is that we want them to learn. So they'll read several pieces of poetry, they'll read several memoirs, um, they'll read several short stories, flash fiction. And the project in the end is uh, assessments along the way and writing along the way. The final project is to actually create your own poem, to create your own short story, to create your own piece of flash, flash fiction. And, and two years ago, the sixth and seventh grades adopted uh, a new curriculum called My Perspectives. And it is based in the writing-based curriculum. 
um, and it is jam-packed. It has five units. Each grade level has five units. If you don't breathe and you hit the ground running from the minute you walk into the school till the end and do nothing else in between and there are no snow days and there's no vacation, we might get through that entire curriculum. So um, what our teachers have been doing for the last two years, years in sixth and seventh grade, they've been working extremely hard. The first year was hard, it was tough. It was a new curriculum, it's challenging. They were afraid the students, it was gonna be too hard for the students. But as they progressed through it, it was hard for them and it was hard for the students. But lo and behold, oh my gosh, they're getting this, it's working. Our kids are really learning. And when I asked them at one point last year, probably in January, February, how do you feel compared to last year? Do you feel like your students have grown more and they know more and they, their skills are more honed at this time than they were last year? And the sixth grade teacher said without a doubt, without a minute without pausing at all, uh, said absolutely. Um, and they can see it this year as well. They're seeing the same thing, but they're obviously better at it now this year. And what we're doing is, even though it is backward designed by the company, we've had to take a couple of these units and put them into other units to make sure that we're uh, meeting all of the core standards and, and developing all those skills. Plus, we believe in larger pieces. So these, the curriculum in sixth and seventh grade are based on, on smaller pieces, but we want to develop sustained reading, what I call stamina, um, and so we didn't want to forget the novel or the play, the longer works. So each of these on the side, you'll see that for each of the grades, I've either included other works that they read or the work the specific works that are part of the curriculum. Um, so <laughs> if you can see, that there, those are the big ideas and the uh, central questions for each unit in sixth grade. And then in seventh, um, they read, again, they read two novels, and they are addressing those five units. So uh, in seventh grade, they have combined three, all five <coughs> of them into three units, and then this summer, um, they are going to actually be putting it to paper. So once they've gone through the second year and they're very comfortable with the curriculum and the way that they've designed it, they're now going to put it into their own, into Upper Dublin's version of backward design. Um, eighth grade um, was solely designed, designed um, solely by the eighth grade teachers. Uh, no textbook. They, uh, we, we took a lot of training and had a lot of training in writing-based curriculum and they hit the ground running with it and they developed these units and every year the units change because the eighth grade teachers are never happy with what they're doing and they're constantly changing and making it better. And um, this is 100% writing based. Um, and they have had extreme success with this. And every time in their classroom, the kids are excited and engaged, it's amazing. When they get into the high school, it turns more, it focuses more. So we take the skills that we developed through the writing based curriculum and now we want to move it into more of a literature-based curriculum. Obviously, all these skills are intertwined. Um, the ninth grade uh, is titled Literary Genres, so they study all types of genres from all around the world. In 10th grade, it is American literature. Um, again, with all of these novels, um, Julius Caesar, uh, the plays, Count of Monte Cristo, they have to study the history that goes with it. So the teachers, English teachers are also history teachers at the same time. Um, their big ideas are constrained perspectives, relationships, dreams, and through these works, we are uh, digging deeper into these, these ideas and these concepts. And interestingly, our world right now is providing us with many world world examples and conversations in a lot of what we're doing. Um, so it really has engaged and kept the, the students um, interested, at least I think it's kept them interested. Um, 11th grade, um, so as we discussed earlier, 9th and 10th grade is full-fledged, uh, uh, just an academic and an honors level. So when they get into 11th grade, uh, the question was asked, why are we not moving more towards a choice when we get into 11th grade? And I think it was addressed that um, some of the concerns were for 11th grade English specifically, that with the term paper, um, we wanted to make sure that the supports were in place for the students. So we started this conversation last year. The 11th grade curriculum review began in September. We took a look at our curriculum. We had a lot of conversations. We brought a lot of new works to the table. And in the end, what we decided, and uh, Ava has alluded to this, is that we believe for a student 
to be well-rounded in their education, that they need to be exposed to the specific types of literature that we were already teaching. Now, that doesn't mean we didn't make changes. We did update it. We added uh, a graphic novel. Um, we uh, revised the, the term paper. The term paper was a bit of a bear. And we felt like it was way too much for the students to learn all that they, we were trying to get them to learn in one paper. So we revised all of that. We made sure that it fit into the AP classes as well. And in the end, um, we went back and forth numerous times. Do we, because now we have an AP class, so now we have three levels. So do we actually go from two to four um, options? And no matter how we looked at it, uh, we, were concerned that there was still going to be a, a group of students who needed that extra support specifically with the writing. Because what we did when we revised the 11th grade curriculum is we added two papers. Uh, we added an additional paper to have two. So they write a smaller or a shorter paper in the first semester, and then the larger term paper um, that is a, an author study of a novel um, is in the second semester. And we were, we were very concerned about those students not having those additional supports. Um, we had a lot of conversations about the fact that this is only our second year of detracking, and uh, we weren't comfortable yet moving in that direction. With that said, it was been, has been made very clear that this is a smaller class, this is the year to try it, to explore, to see what happens. And as Tony said, we're not sure how that's going to play out, because this is the first group of students coming through who have never, who have only had uh, two tracks, who have either been honors or academic. So if we offer a three, an academic three, what will that look like? And we don't know. We could end up without an academic three. So we are keeping our fingers crossed and we're gonna see what happens and we're gonna make whatever happens work. And we're gonna use, going to use next year to assess and see what we need to do moving forward. It, I truly believe and I feel um, the struggle that I saw the teachers endure through the last year about what the right thing to do is, was real. And it was really based on what they felt was best for students. And they were very concerned about students who might need um, to uh, have the option of taking a short story study as opposed to the novel study. And essentially, that class, the papers, both papers are, t are taught, and most of the work is done within school with specific support, a lot more support, and helping them. Because writing a research paper and learning how to research and synthesize is a very challenging um, task. So we don't want any of our students uh, falling through the cracks or failing or being so frustrated that they give up. So we wanted to keep that option. And that's where we are with um, 11th grade. Um, and the AP literature, this is in the works too. Both uh, the regular 11th grade classes and the AP classes, uh, we are in the midst of writing the backwards design. So it's a little um, cryptic right now. Um, but we did have, we did revise it last year, we made decisions, and now we're putting in the backwards design. Uh, 12th grade, British literature. And in British literature, this is the time that um, Tony's a year ahead. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we are in the midst right now of a 12th grade curriculum review for English. And so we're gonna wait one more year to actually uh, implement the new curriculum. As of now, this is, these are our big ideas and these are our units. 12th grade. It's a mix of time periods. So here you can see the history um, with the big ideas. And a lot of it is uh, deals with power and absolute power. And again, we have a lot of really good conversations right now. It connects very well with our modern day um, allegory. So some of it's genre, some of it's history based, and some of it is um, greater concept based. And AP language and composition. Um, just in case, just for the record, uh, unfortunately, English is the only AP that does not provide a curriculum. So in all the other subjects, they hand the curriculum to the teacher. English has to create its own curriculum. So uh, Mr. Hillman right now is the teacher for AP Language and Composition, has been for the last four years. And he has created these, but when I met with him last month, he's now has all these great new ideas, and he, we're, he's in the midst of revising these as well, but his is very writing-based, um, and obviously follows the guidelines of AP line and composition. We don't have as many electives as uh, history does, or social studies does, 
Uh, we have speech and debate, which generally uh, ninth and 10th grade teachers take this, but sometimes a junior or senior come, will come back and take it as well. It's a, it's a great course. Um, students who take it learn a lot about speaking, uh, debating, uh, communicating civilly, which is very important, and then creative writing. So right now we only have one class of each of these um, at this point, but uh, both of these, only one teacher teaches both of these, same person, and she is spending a lot of time this year and this summer backwards designing. Questions or comments from the committee? Um, thanks for the presentation. And a um, couple of questions. The first one, with the emphasis on writing in the uh, middle school, what is happening for kids who have trouble writing? Because I can think of physical limitations, mm -hmm. but also just writing is not necessarily their thing. They grow up in a very verbal world. Yeah. Um, how is that? included in so I, um, I, well, To start, almost every teacher does uh, engages in something called a do now every day or two to three times a week. Uh, and that means that students come in, they sit down and they immediately write. And it's, uh, there's usually a question or an activity on the board or the interwrite board and students then write and uh, react to that question. It's usually related to the topic they're discussing in, the, in that day or something that they read last night and or sometimes it's just in high interest to get them writing because it pr improves fluency to write untimed freely what I refer to excuse the the reference throwing up on the page so it's, it really does help with the fluency um, each it, during the uh, the planning of the, uh, of the backward design uh, on average there is a there are three main papers written in every uh, grade level. Um, and when I say written, I, I mean it, it's used, there, there's a process. So students, it's not an essay test. They literally write in the process, they do peer evaluation, they revise, so full-fledged beginning to end. That's where we are, the writing in general. And then and the other question is the integration of technology with, in both middle and high school curriculum. Um, so can, can you, uh, specifically what do you, you think, so as, because uh, I have Chromebooks, which they use all the time, but it, they use it for their do nows, they use it um, on comment boards, they're constantly uh, using it in group work, so we often create uh, documents that hold every student accountable, so if they do group work, they all must write on the, on the document, be responsible for a part of it, or they, uh, or when they work in group, they must have an individual sheet and participate in that way? Yeah, I think I was thinking very much of using Google Docs or anything like that, but at the same time, is most of the writing done typing, or is there still physical? That's a good question. Um, so I, in, in English, at least in my class, most of it is done typing. Um, I think that is the wave right now. I think most uh, students and most classes are using the typing of the, in the Chromebook uh, more so than the handwritten. Um, in terms of, the, of writing, um, I know in, in social studies, um, at, at least at the AP level, um, there is still a focus on handwriting, uh, not <coughs> like writing by hand, uh, only because on the exam, uh, students are required to do that and it's timed. So it almost as like a, a physical training that they just need to be able to do that in that specific amount of time. So while they are writing a lot uh, on the computer, there's definitely still some emphasis on, on handwriting, um, at, at least in you know, social studies a little bit. Just to add to the writing piece, um, we've gotten together a number of times and are developing very specific times across our curriculum, social studies, science, English, um, where we're looking to make sure that, for example, in sixth grade, there's some narrative writing, there's some persuasive writing, there's some informational writing, just to make sure that that's happening. Um, certainly in the, our new curriculum, in my perspective, every unit has a, um, an assessment that is a writing assessment. So I do think that over the past years, the practice of writing, the peer feedback of writing, 
teachers giving feedback as the writing is unfolding has increased quite a bit. And I'll just compliment that. Um, that yeah, the technology is an accelerator for, for those best practices. At the same time when I, or I'm asked which, to write by hand or to type, I always say yes. Okay. Like those are very different cognitive processes and they amplify each other. Right? Um, and so, and, and if I do write both, I, you know, if I take notes on Post-its and then I synthesize on a Google Doc together collaboratively, or if I, all members of a class respond to a prompt in a Schoology discussion, I suddenly have the reticent participants contributing when they, normally they wouldn't. I've also created an anticipatory set for all the students because then they want to see how the others have answered. And then, and then you close it and you synthesize with the conversation, right? And so um, uh, the tech can accelerate great practice, but we always have to remember um, you know, the biology of, of the machine that we are, right? So we are social uh, learners and we're kinesthetic learners. And so um, there's a very different cognitive process that happens when you write by hand. Uh, and it's important to do both and complement both and, and make space for both in our practice. How much opportunity is there, I know technology is a facilitator, but this can happen whether you use technology or not, is, how much opportunity is there for, for other than peer review, uh, for uh, comments and review by mm -hmm. The instructor and rewriting because I think that really helps people learn. Um, well, that's a very easy question because I truly, I wholeheartedly believe, and we've had many discussions about this in the department about just that. And so, it sounds great. It sounds wonderful. This concept of write, reading a draft as a student is writing it. Um, it depends on which teacher it is because some are. Uh, a little bit more like I am, and I need to read everything and give more, too much feedback, um, and that's not healthy. Um, and then other teachers, you know, will do it, and it's it's an easy flow for them. So we're working on that. So some teachers, right now in my department, I know that I have done that. I've done it with uh, two of the essays so far. I'm working on one right now, and it has been. Um, so I would say, like, I'm the lead piloter right now on that. And there have been a couple of the teachers in the department who've done the same thing. And what we've decided is the difference between their draft and their final copy, and after years and years of teaching, has been amazing. The process of giving them feedback as they're writing, um, the question, the more engaged they are, they ask questions, um, and I, I saw so much more growth doing it that way. It is time consuming. So I think some teachers have also tried the approach of um, you know, only because there are only so many hours in the day and they want to get the, the feedback to them immediately, is they, they tried uh, reading maybe an introductory paragraph, one body paragraph that they choose, and their conclusion on their draft just to give them feedback in the process what, as they're writing. Um, we've also had numerous discussions about this concept of when a paper is handed in and you've given it a grade, um, should it stop there? My philosophy is no. My philosophy is if a student is willing to take my feedback, and rewrite it and do better and improve their grade, um, then I'm more than happy to do so. Um, I, will, I don't know if every teacher in the department is there right now, but it is part of the discussion and it is a, a, it's a changing the way that we've taught and thought for a long time. And the teachers in my department are very open-minded and are really working hard at making those changes. So, um, and this is really the first year that I, uh, through the coaching of, of Google Phil over there. Um, uh, he really did help me to understand the importance of reading the paper as we as they write. So we are going to get there. We're just in the baby steps of that right now. Uh, so with a lot of the curriculum changes that have been happening at the elementary level, uh, most of those have been in ELA. I'm wondering, I guess, in terms of the starting point that we backwards designed. Is there any thought as to if that's going to be different, knowing that there's been curriculum changes at the elementary level, now coming into the secondary, that might be changing any of this. So I, I can address uh, the fact that three years ago we went through a curriculum review, K through 12, and um, we, we established that, uh, that the sixth and seventh did want to adopt a new curriculum, and uh, 
what we ultimately decided was we adopted a, the curriculum from the same company that the elementary did. So <coughs> elementary has ReadyGen, and my perspectives is related to ReadyGen, and we are very excited to see how that progresses as we see K through seven progress through the, the same <coughs> type of standards and teaching. Uh, any other comments or questions from other members of the board? I don't think so. So thank you very much, and um, I understand the comments about levels and, and tracks, and hope you know you, that this year is a good trial year, and look forward to hearing a little bit more next year as to what the next steps are. And, and I, one thing I wanted to add that I forgot to say is we, we are in the middle of looking at the 12th grade curriculum and the topic of conversation for 12th grade is has been parallel with what uh, social studies is doing. Um, we feel like by 12th grade with a term paper, with no term, major term paper and their skills having been already honed that we are going, we are really considering choice such as dystopia, utopia, um, African-American literature, um, how the English language struck began, uh, interview, writing, world life skills. So we, we are brainstorming all of those right now. So I think in 12th grade, um, there is a, a, a significantly good chance that it will be more based on just an academic choice level. Okay, okay. all right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Our next presentation is our K-12 Director of Guidance, Ms. Donna Ward, and she is going to give us an update regarding the program of studies um, along with some minor changes and an overview of that program. School board members, administration, colleagues, community, parents, friends. Oh, sorry. Good evening and Happy New Year. It's my pleasure to be here again tonight to present to you the 2018, I'm sorry, 2018-19 program of studies. Thank you. This is the third year now we are presenting this document to the school board. If you click on the hyperlink, you will right into this very comprehensive document. Uh, I'm not going to go into the document as I have a presentation presented, but as you look through the document, I would like you to keep in mind that this was, this is a very comprehensive document that my colleagues, coordinators, high school administration, technology department, um, everyone had a hand in creating this, um, again, very creative and important document, I think, to help guide our students, parents, and families in the process of course selection. I also want to note that as you do click on the document, the front cover each year is, I don't want to say a competition, but a competition we put out to students that they can create and design the cover, and this year's cover was created by Ella Eustis, a ninth grade student. Uh, I told her that it would be mentioning her, her name tonight at the school board. So thank you, Ella. The document itself is basically in two sections. The first section of the book is, it gives descriptions about procedures, timeline, uh, course selection practice, talks about special programs and gives descriptions um, of uh, programs like dual enrollment, gifted summer scholars. And the second portion of the document each department has an opportunity to provide a summary, uh, a visual scope and sequence, and also give explicit um, uh, summaries of each and every course at each and every level offered at the high school. The booklet itself also has grade level practice cards uh, for parents and students to download. We do provide paper copies to students so that they can with paper and pencil practice, uh, what courses they would like to select, but there are electronic copies of those cards as well within the document. This is one example of our core, um, at the history department, uh, there is a visual representation of courses from 9th, 10th, 
obviously through 12th grade. So it can give students and parents an idea of what core classes are required and expected of them. Uh, and you'll find in some areas you'll see also elective courses are also mentioned. Over the past year, there have been many discussions about uh, curriculum changes or, or updates. Here I have five that have been discussed either through um, these meetings or in the curriculum summit, obviously at, at the administrative level in each building as well. Uh, I'll just, I'm going to mention them. Obviously tonight we have the 12th grade social studies courses mentioned. Uh, there's been discussion about adding the environmental science project-based learning course, which we do anticipate we will have it at one section of this coming year. During the December Education Committee meeting, I believe you heard about the Pathways of Technology courses. In the Mathematics Department, we are changing at the high school the sequence of classes to follow suit with math students at uh, the middle school, the sequence that they follow. And there is a change in our world language program where we are now moving from a five day week to a two day week plus program. Essentially the course selection process works differently in both buildings at the high school level. All students in ninth, 10th and 11th grade classes or courses are recommended by their core classes are recommended by their, their teachers and then they can self select their elective classes. Guidance counselors uh, during a three week period of time will meet with all of their students individually thanks to the history department. We plant ourselves right outside of the history alcove area and pull each student out one at a time and meet again with each student to review big picture and what their course selections look like and what it will be the following year. At the middle <laughs> school, uh, there's one guidance counselor and there are classroom presentations Mrs. Babin, who's currently the, the eighth grade school counselor, will go into all eighth grade classes, and then I will follow uh, with a second presentation, and I bring students down along with me to talk about the course selection process and how to select, select classes. That's all I have for you, my friends. Are there any questions or comments? We currently have one section of students taking FLESS five days a week um, using the same staffing. If we go to three days a week, we can have two sections, so more students will have the opportunity for that. So you're saying three times? Three, three times or two times a week? Two times. Two times a week. Oh. All right. And then the PPL choice in environmental, is that going to be a, a choice for students, whether they go PBL or regular? Correct. So we have a, um, we're starting, we're running a pilot this next year. Um, our ninth grade students were surveyed um, with very specific information around what it might be like to be in a PBL course. And we had about 20 students, 20 to 25 students indicate some interest. Um, our environmental science teacher, Aaron Block, has already informally had one or two sections of PBL environmental science. We're just looking to formalize that a little bit more this year. The hope is that as we um, were discussing options for 11th and 12th grade, a project-based environmental science course might emerge for students to take beyond 10th grade. And then the last question, um, the pathway for math. Am I understanding this right that you're going to algebra one to algebra two and then geometry? That's correct. And that had already been initiated at the middle school in terms of the pathway there. Um, and our math department, um, particularly with the light of keystones, if you're in ninth grade, algebra one, um, you have a second opportunity in the beginning of algebra two to really hone those skills if you're not proficient yet. You'll also find the SAT now at more focuses on algebra than it does geometry. There are limited questions in geometry so for students who are college bound. It 
makes more sense to have algebra two earlier. Um, I know we've talked about this in previous years. Um, uh, I, I think that the way the program of studies was revised to be sort of online and clickable and linked to the table of contents and to the various sections was an amazing improvement from what it had been before. So I haven't read every, every description this year. Um, but I really think it's, uh, I mean, it was a nice job. I know it's a big job. I know that the year that made the transition. Um, I'm also excited about the PBL option for environmental science. Um, neither of those are questions. They're just comments. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? For the PBL, what type of student are you hoping to attract? There's no profile for the student in terms of um, a specific academic or honor level. Um, there's a fairly well-developed um, description. Um, so a student who enjoys the kind of creative work involved in doing project-based learning um, with the description that the teacher is more a coach, helping the students, a coach by the side. And so um, by ninth grade, I think students are beginning to show some preferences and that they have an opportunity if they'd like to do that kind of learning, uh, they, they can see if that fits well for them. So, Does the student have an option of taking it as an honors? Or we currently don't offer honors environmental it's science. Never, yeah, so we'll continue, that will continue. Right. That's right. And the description's on page 49 if anyone's interested. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. And uh, Mark. Yeah. Okay. As, as a follow-up to that, is the decision to do it, uh, to do project-based learning formally in environmental science first because the teacher was ready or is it something about the subject matter that particularly lends itself or um, is the expectation assuming it goes well to expand that and if so, in what direction? I think the answer is both. Um, we do have a teacher who is very interested in project-based learning and she's done some really great work and we've shared in the past um, with a project she did with the Philadelphia Zoo and her class, another project with the, um, the reservoir um, where they created a wiki, a wiki page for the reservoir that had not yet existed and apparently it's not important enough to continue to exist, but nonetheless students were doing the work. Um, so I do think it's a little bit of both and I think it's a really healthy, productive environment for our teachers when if they really have a passion to give them opportunity to follow that and see where it can take our students and our staff as well. So if it is successful, is there a plan? Uh, by plan, I mean, is there an actual structured plan to expand it in some particular direction or do we, is it more of a wait and see at this point? I think we need to first see what it looks like um, and measure the success of that course. Um, by a number of different standards. Um, I also think there will be some staffing considerations that we need to, to take into account. Um, offering an additional option for a science course can have staffing implications, so I think we're taking small steps right now. Um, we're going to try this and um, see how it goes. And I think you know sometimes you have to try something. Sometimes it's successful, sometimes you fail, both times you learn. I'm just wondering more about project-based learning and, and how much more we can do with it. Naively, I would think in 12th grade, uh, there should be a lot more uh, PBL going on in, in, in many of the subjects by, by then. Uh, maybe, Mr. Vinogradov, do you, do you see five years from now, what, what's your vision on project-based learning? I think this is a growth area and an opportunity for collaboration between my department, um, Dr. Miner, David Morrison, right, and all of our curricular leaders and, and really all of our faculty. Um, you know, when people think about project-based learning, they, they think of the, the poster board or the diorama that you did at the end of the unit of study, right? And that's just a project tacked on. It's very different from a project driving 
you're learning, right? Um, so how can I reduce uh, or improve um, the envelope on my school building to reduce my, my fuel costs? That's a real question. Um, and you can make it more and more authentic. Like, we're really going to do this. We're going to come to the school board with a proposal. We're going to go to facilities with a proposal. We're going to bring in architects and engineers, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to start to, to have Google Hangouts with experts from outside, right? And there are all those, those layers. And um, to build that capacity, there's not only building capacity with the teacher, but it's building learner capacity. That has to start really young. Um, Project-based learning is, it, it's really difficult, right? It's just because it's, it's authentic, it's the real world. Um, and we face those problems all the time as adults, and our education probably didn't do a lot to prepare us for that. Um, right, and so you know, I, I know how to read the manual, but if there's no manual, I'm in a lot of trouble, right? Uh, so we have to build learner capacity not only for that kind of thinking, but also for self-discipline, management, coordination, um, and so it's uh, it's a piece that we really have to also work at building that cultural capacity, that interest, that sense of urgency. And then also uh, engaging parents, right? Demystifying what is project-based learning and, uh, and what does that look like? I think that when you begin to articulate a course like this, well, this is a real choice. I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to learn this way. Right? I'm signing up because this is gonna be different. It's a whole different set of responsibility for me as a learner to, and it's not gonna be a compliance-based classroom. The worksheet is really easy. It's very boring, but it's really easy to do, right? Um, but project-based learning is not. Um, and so uh, I think this is a great way to start, to build that capacity, to celebrate it, to communicate it, to get other teachers interested. And we already have a lot of teachers who are interested in integrating project-based learning principles into their classes, and we see more and more of that happening. Um, this doing it at the scale of a course, right, will be a great opportunity for everybody to learn. Uh, together. I went to a project-based learning school as a kid, right, so 7th through 12th grade. Um, so it's not a new concept at all. Um, it's very, very powerful, but it's hard to bring a whole community to that place uh, uh, overnight, right? Uh, there's no app for that, right? So it's, 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 it's good work, it's hard work, um, and it's not exclusive of other teaching modalities, right? So it's not an, an abandonment of a direct instruction, right? Or individual learning versus collaborative learning. It's really a thoughtful synthesis of all of those. That was a long answer to your question. There isn't a five-year plan for it, though, but it's, it's an organic piece of work. One other question I have regarding the honor roll. Uh, I noticed the, the uh, Listserv that, that Mr. Schultz sent out, and I'm sort of proud of seeing so many names on the honor roll. Have we been doing the honor roll for a number of years, or did we just bring it back? Can I just yell the answer? <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm trying to figure out how it's calculated when you say unweighted. So if they can get a five for an A, it comes down to a four? That is correct. So the, uh, the calculation for it has not changed. It's been a 3.2 uh, unweighted as long as I've been around and I can remember. Um, it has always been on the student's report card. We have just gotten back to publishing it through various venues this year. Great. Thank you. Good idea. Uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. And also, could I ask people in the audience if you are going to have a significant conversation to take it outside rather than disrupting other people. Um, okay, next up, uh, Dr. Miner will be talking about the RTI program. Good evening, thank you so much for having uh, me tonight to give this presentation. I'm very excited to share our first semester of RTII data, in fact, we're not actually through our first semester of RTII. We had a rolling start. So we have a 12-week semester in the fall and a 12-week semester in the spring. So we still have a little way to go, um, but we're excited to share the data that we've collected so far. Today, um, fortuitously, 
I had the opportunity with several colleagues to go to the Bucks County Intermediate Unit to see a presentation on the use of data. And as the presenter was presenting, I was changing my presentation because I thought, oh my gosh, I need this slide. So um, pardon me for those of you who looked in it earlier and didn't see this slide and some others. But why I wanted to include it was the presenter talked about John Hattie's work on the effect size of various school practices on student achievement. And if you look at this uh, graphical display of that, there are certain things that can be done in schools that actually have a negative effect size and cause students to lose ground in terms of their learning. There are things that have uh, just developmental effects. So a child would have learned with or without that happening, right? They just would have ha happened as a course of development. And then in the orange, you can see typical teacher effects. A year's growth in a year's time. Good teacher, teaching the curriculum properly. That's what we expect for kids. Through the green and then especially over to the blue are things that have a greater effect size. And so one of the things that the presenter asked, and I, I think it's very powerful when we talk about RTI, um, so I'll pose it to the group, is if a child is a year behind in second grade and they have a good teacher and they teach exactly the curriculum and they gain a year in a year's time, when they get to third grade, where is that child? A year behind, right? And so what we're really trying to do with RTII is say, in addition to the high quality instruction, the instruction part of RTII, we need to have an intervention that accelerates learning for kids so that they don't make just a year's growth in a year's time, they make more than a year's growth because that's what it takes for kids to catch up. So I was excited, so I added the second slide, when she shared that this effect size research uh, now lists RTII as one of the highest impact effect sizes that you can have uh, in a child's education. This, the book by Hattie has many, many more uh, items that, I'm, that are showing here on the screen, but I was, I was thrilled to see that uh, given our work. So tonight I want to share with you primarily STAR uh, reporting regarding our children's academic achievement from September screening to the winter screening, uh, which happened in December, right before conferences. And this is a sample slide of what you'll be seeing moving forward. So in the green are students who are at or above benchmark. Blue are students who are on watch. They're right there, they could go either way. Students in yellow need intervention and students in red need urgent intervention. They're significantly below grade level. The other thing you'll notice is that a black line is struck, and that is the 40th percentile. So students who rank in the 40th percentile on the star-scaled score, which is created through millions of pieces of student data, are considered to be hitting that grade level's benchmark. So the 40th percentile rank is where that scaled score is set. I don't know why this keeps bouncing backwards. Okay. So, we're going to just go quickly through, and what I would ask is that you think about it in terms of trends. I had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Levinowitz on the way up, and he said, is every single bar a kid? Um, it's created from a bunch of individual kids, but I would caution you on a few things. One, a child moves in, a child moves out. Kid to kid, it may not be the exact same day to fall to winter. Um, so, I would encourage you to look at this as trends, not on the individual kid to kid level, uh, as you kind of assess. So in kindergarten, students take the STAR Early Literacy Assessment. This is uh, how we began the year at Thomas Fitzwater. And this is where we are in December in terms of those categories of kids. So we're very excited to see that. The other thing that I would encourage you to note in these slides is the scale changes from the left to the right because sometimes the bar gets higher. Sometimes it's not as significant, but if you notice, in the case of kindergarten, we're now up to 800, and to get to that black line, you need a score of 550. So it's a moving target in this case. And I think you can see the arching out of the green, the kids who are getting way above, that's really a testament to all of the things that we're doing in our curriculum. We're doing a lot with our ELA program, we have foundations, we have ReadyGen. Uh, all of those components factor in there, certainly. Um, but that's an exciting change. You can see the same kind of pattern at Fort Washington, you can see the same at Maple Glen. So we're very happy and at Jarrah Town seeing those, those trend changes for our students 
uh, seeing that red uh, get smaller and smaller. First grade is a little more complex because the assessment changes in first grade. We start out at the beginning of the year giving students that early literacy. And by that midpoint, we want to see them take the reading assessment. So it's actually an entirely different scaled score now. Um, so again, I would encourage you to interpret it with caution, uh, but to look for the patterns, particularly the patterns surrounding how far students are off of that benchmark line. Um, and that, that's very encouraging. So now the students are actually expected to, in the early literacy, they take it with headphones, they're doing letters and sounds, and in the reading test, they're, they're reading, uh, there's no headphones involved, it's completely student driven. So there's the Fort Washington change, Maple Glen, and Jarrettown. So again, very, very, very happy with the first grade results. Second grade, it's reading test to reading test, so the scale doesn't change. Thomas Fitzwater, Fort Washington, Maple Glen. And again, I think that pushing out of the, the green, how much higher our students are getting, you can see so many of them are up over 400. That's really um, great to see. And you can see that consistently throughout the elementary schools here. It is at Jarrettown. <coughs> Third grade, reading to reading, Fort Washington, Maple Glen. Jarrettown. And at fourth grade, you're going to notice that the change in all the schools isn't quite as significant. So why is that? And again, Dr. Levinitz and I discussed it in the stairwell and he hit the nail on the head. It's much harder to close the gap as kids get older. One of the things that we really want to do is catch them as soon as they come in. My prediction for you is that in three, four, five years when these kids are fourth and fifth graders, these numbers will be smaller because we will have filled these gaps in kindergarten and first and second grade. Um, we do have special education students participating in these programs, with few exceptions for students who receive full replacement instruction for whom the IEP team uh, doesn't think it would be appropriate, um, but, but we do have participation. And we also have participation from English language learners. Um, philosophically, when we have English language learners, we're actually placing them in our tier one intervention, our junior grade books intervention, so that they have language exposure. We're assuming they don't have a reading problem, and so we don't fix that with a reading intervention. So um, just a caveat there as well. Port Washington, Maple Glen. Again, you can see the continuing trends in all the schools of the green uh, getting much higher, the bar, uh, the gap closing with that black bar, and in fifth grade. Washington, Glen, Jarrettown. So it's nice to show charts, but I really wanted to show actual student uh, work as well. Charts tell a story, but I think student work tells a story. So this is a really nice story that a reading specialist sent to me, which is the transfer of what's happening in foundations coming into the LLI intervention. This is one of the things you really hope to see in education is you teach a child a skill and they transfer that skill on their own. So that without prompting, you can see when kids are writing plural words, they're marking up the S because that's a bonus letter in foundations and they just naturally are, are starting to apply those skills. So super exciting to see, especially with our students who are struggling uh, the most. Here's an example of a first grader's writing who needed a tier three intervention at the beginning of the year in December you can see the change in their writing. And again, that's a testament to all kinds of things that are happening in the curriculum, as well as the focus in RTI. So very exciting to see an individual student have that kind of a change in such a short period of time. In second grade, I talked at the beginning about the importance of making more than a year's gain in a year's time. In February, I'm gonna come back and speak to the Education Committee about guided reading. And when we talk about that, we're gonna talk more about uh, the levels um, for independent and instructional uh, reading. So on the left, you can see the F and P text gradient chart. So you can see that a student who is in an F is middle of first grade reader. This is a second grade student's data. You can see they started at an F. They've been participating in LLI with a reading specialist. They are now at a K, which puts them on track to be caught up by the end of second grade and not continue to be a year behind. So 
This is absolutely thrilling to see. As much fun as student work is to see, it is even more fun to hear about it. So I have a few guests in the audience. I'm going to ask them to come up and just share some brief anecdotal stories of student success for your enjoyment. Tester. I'm a reading specialist at Maple Glen in Jarrettown, and we're just so excited about LLI and, of course, seeing this incredible growth in our students. Um, we teach students that are that qualify for Tier Three supports, and we're using. I teach eight groups of LLI each day, um, and not only is it just an incredibly comprehensive program. You know, every day they come and they we revisit the, the book from the day before. We do a close read or a vocabulary. Um, activity or it might be um, a fluency exercise. We do word work and um, phonics and then we do introduction to a new book and teach them about, you know, like the questioning strategies before and after, you know. So then we do the new book, we do, um, uh, there's a really strong writing component. I mean, so not only is the program so strong and we're seeing them make such great strides, they just love it. They love the books. They were really stretching them to like their highest <coughs> instructional level and trying to then yeah, accelerate them and really, really meet their needs and just kind of push them along. But um, because the books are, you know, high interest and such quality, um, they are so, and they cover all genres, all topics, they love them so much, they love coming. They come running through the door, our fifth graders. I mean, we say, we teach K through five and, you know, the fifth graders come running in, they can't wait to see what book they're reading. They want to take the books back and share them with their classroom teachers. They ask to take them home. Um, they, before they leave, they want to see what books they're going to be doing the next day. So I know we, we were talking about how just incredible it is that love of reading is really taking off now that their confidence is building and they're just feeling so good about what they're doing. Um, we'll be sitting at the table and our time will be up and I'll have fifth graders who are asking for just a few more minutes that they want to spend with their books and it's just, it's incredible because you just, you know, the, just seeing their confidence and as well as all of, of course, their skills and their ability to take off, it's just an incredible thing. And now it's exciting because at this point in the year, we really are seeing that we are accelerating these kids and we have the tool now with LLI to do it. So I, I don't want to say too much about this. Thank you. Um, I'm Katie Leggard. I am a reading specialist at Maple Glen. Um, I was a kindergarten teacher in our district for 11 years before moving into this position. So um, on top of everything that Marissa said about the older, reluctant readers who were not confident, so they came in the door saying, well, I hate reading, so what are we gonna, you know, what, what are we doing? Because I don't want to do this, I don't want to read this books. Now to see them wanting, not able to get enough. Can I take it home with me? Oh, remember when we read the other book in this series? Can I look at one of those to see if this happened? Just to see, that love coming along in those kids that I don't know if they've ever loved reading. Um, but to take it down to the primary level, I had um, I shared with Dr. Minor and the reading department and everyone I can find to share this story with that um, my first grade reading club, when they came in, um, the first day a little boy said to me, well, you're calling this reading club. I don't know how to read, so what are we doing here? Like, what is the purpose of this place? Because I cannot read at all. And so make you a promise, you're gonna read a book today, and you're gonna read a book every day that you're here. Now he comes in, puffed up, ready to go. What are we reading today? Goes home and reads his book to someone at home every night, and he feels like a reader, and he no longer makes the statements of, I can't read. And I think a lot of that, I can't read, is what later turns into the, I hate to read. Um, and it all goes back to that lack of confidence and ability. So we are seeing it from kindergarten students that are um, transferring those foundation skills, um, students who do no letters, no sounds, who are now able to independently and confidently transfer that from the reading room to their classroom, to home, to speech, to OT. It's amazing to see. We never really, I guess, felt that connection as strongly from the reading room to the classroom. It was, oh, I do that in my classroom too, where now we are also their classroom and they're using it in both places. Um, but to see that stretch from K all the way up to five and then to see a high school presentation tonight talking about trying to continue and nurture that love of reading, it's really cool to see that we're starting to see so much more of it in our most reluctant and struggling readers at the elementary level. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you both so much. I just want to say, uh, you know, Ms. Wengert and Ms. Tester are miraculous. I mean, the work that they do along with all of the reading specialists is just Herculean. I, th this is a difficult, challenging program. They embraced the professional development and, and it really is only as good as the uh, dedication of the teachers who teach it. So I can't say enough about how wonderful uh, they are and all of the teachers who are working in this program. And it's so exciting to um, have them email me or share one of their stories of success. Um, we also have principals in the audience this evening. Um, I know that Mr. Austin and Mr. Brickard wanted to say a word uh, as well about what they're seeing uh, with RTI in their buildings. Thank you for inviting me to... Uh... Yeah, you can just pull that right out. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm a little excited. I'm going to admit that. Uh, not that we routinely, and I, I don't want to brag about Thomas Fitzwater alone, because we're used to seeing a lot of growth, but the speed of the growth, we, we've never encountered this before. This is year number eight for me, but what's happened from September to January, like I said, we've never seen it before, and, and the stories that they've told has been very consistent. The, the transfer of the skills, not only from the children in the reading room, but the comprehension, the level in that tier one group, it, it's, I'm going to take the PSSAs tomorrow. I'll put it to you that way. That's how excited I am. What the, why wait? We're ready. And, and that trend just keeps growing. But uh, I'm also glad to hear Dr. Miner say that it's, it's RTI. It's also a lot of other interventions that we're putting in place, but they're all coming together, and it's just exciting. So I'll, I'll start rambling now. Thank you. Good evening. It is January and School Board Appreciation Month, so allow me to be the first to say thank you to all the school board members uh, for all you guys doing your volunteer. I think um, Dr. Miner spoke and, and you heard the passion in Katie and Marissa and what they were seeing with the kids' growth. Um, Dr. Miner talked about the teachers and their excitement. I think, um, and, and maybe it's understood, but I think it's really important to make note of um, what we've been able to do this year um, through Dr. Miner's leadership is put materials in the hands of the teachers that for many years was missing. So um, RTII is not new to Upper Dublin, um, certainly not new to Maple Glen, but for the first time what we've been able to do is put research-based, scientifically proven materials in the hands of all of our teachers. And uh, Peter talks about tier one kids, and so we're not just talking about the lowest kids, the neediest kids who are working with our reading specialists every day with the LLI materials, but all of those kids, also those kids on the borderline in tier two with the text types, in uh, tier one with the purchase of junior grade books. Um, for a long time, we are a high achieving district. Our kids are performing. Um, and, and the question for tier one was always, well, what am I gonna do differently with these tier one kids in reading club? I already have two hours of language arts. So what am I gonna do in addition to? Uh, and so for the first time, what we're able to do is actually put an amazing program in junior grade books that only complements the work that's being done in that two hour block with ReadyGen. Um, so Peter talked about uh, a continuum, and I think we see that. So you have um, a solid program in ReadyGen that's going to focus on comprehension and challenging texts, and the kids are going to rise to that, and they're going to have that comprehension, because comprehension is the end game in reading, right? But you're also going to have the programs of foundations that we now have in K and 1, adding in second grade next year in terms of the basic skills, again, that you guys have approved, uh, that you have supported Dr. Miner's efforts, and, and, and pushing this forward so all of our children, our neediest and our most advanced children are receiving um, amazing instruction from the town and staff, but because we're giving them the resources that they need to do that instruction. And I don't think we can lose sight of those materials and those purchases that you have made. Um, and in terms of even the professional growth, Dr. Miner talked about next month, February, addressing guided reading. Next week, we're bringing in Stone Stafford, one of our professional developers, developers to work with a um, I, I want to say it's close to 25 teachers and actually what do you do in a small group and how do you lead a guided reading group and how do you help all of your kids not just the ones who are struggling but what are you doing to develop the the um, uh, the, the, the intellectual capability comprehension based for your high achieving students as well 
Um, and again, so you are, your all support of those efforts uh, is greatly appreciated from all of us. Thank you, Mr. Bickert. And I do want to say a word as well about all of the principals who have been fantastic partners along with Kathy Smythe and Meredith Penner um, as we seek to lead a new initiative, which is extremely challenging but extremely rewarding. And of course, uh, to Mr. Bickard's point, I really do want to thank the board. You have made enormous um, purchases in terms of supporting this program, and uh, I hope that you're able to see through this evening's presentation that they're really paying dividends already. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, those results look really good. So appreciate all the work. And I know there's a lot when you change curriculum and you add new things and you change the schedule that it's a lot for everyone to wrap their arms around, but it looks like it is starting to pay off then. So that sounds really good. Um, comments or questions from? Sure. Um, I'll just echo um, Dr. Lowood's comments in regards to kids. It does look promising and looking forward to how fourth and fifth grade will probably will pan out in the future. I do have a question just in terms of it's not here on the presentation, but if you could suspect in terms of giving a, a data chart from last year in terms of the growth from fall to winter, how would it look different than what it looks um, this year with the, with the implementation of RTII? Well, one of the other fantastic things the board did was support the purchase of STAR. And so I can't tell you that because we had no data before. So one of the things that is really excellent is to have this data tool that allows us to do this and will allow us to track it moving forward. So I would purely be speculating. With the STAR data, um, are you going to use that for maybe summer uh, program preparation? Because I think if I look at Hattie's spec sites, that's probably an area where you could really use it. So that is a really excellent question. One of the things that is a true issue in reading, and particularly with students who struggle with reading in the early grades, is what's called the summer slide. The loss of uh, reading levels between June when they come in, and, or except in June, and when they come in in September. Um, at this point, for this year, we are proposing a pre-K summer program free of charge based on our screening data that will happen in spring. I personally would love to see us at some point move forward using this type of data, supporting our students. Um, I'll give you an example. In the winter, we, uh, when I first started being involved in RTI, we would cut the break at the winter break. That just made logical sense with, with the calendar. And what we found was, our, particularly our younger children, lost so much between the winter break and then the break for collection of data that was four weeks long that we moved it. So we come back, remember at the beginning I said we're not quite done yet, we come back for a couple of weeks, then we take a pause for data collection, and then we regroup. So I would love moving forward to see the district consider, we have summer scholars which is outstanding, but a targeted program for students who can use that extra summer support um, that would be free of charge. But I'm not proposing that at this time, but I think it would be a, a, a great direction to move in, in the future. Yeah, and to follow up, um, how are parents uh, involved in this, especially summer, but maybe also throughout the year? Is there something that you encourage parents to do at home? Yes. So um, one of the things that I was really excited about this year is that for the first time, STAR data was shared by all elementary teachers at their parent conferences. And so they were able to show parents um, those reports. Talk to them specifically. One of the nice things that STAR will do is it will actually say, here's your child's reading level. It connects to something called AR Book Find. It gives parents a list of all of the books that their children would be appropriate for their learning level. It sorts by interest. So if you have a girl who's interested in horses and she's at a third grade reading level, and then it literally will allow you to purchase it right on Amazon or make a library list that you can take to the public library. So teachers are able to share that with parents, which was tremendous because so often parents come and say, what books should I be getting at home? How do I know? And so they were really able to connect the data to that kind of parent support. Um, with foundations, there's a, a big parent piece that, that parents have to learn kind of the language. What does my kid mean when they say a bonus letter? And so, so that's going home. So we've been doing a lot of work with helping parents understand what um, they can do with their children to, to further this success. So um, we'll certainly talk as we get to the end of the year about how they can do that over the summer. Thank you. Any comments or questions from the rest of the board? Thank you very much. Thank you.
Okay, uh, that concludes our presentations. Now we have uh, a few topics that are reports or recommendations for motions for the legislative meeting next week. Um, Mrs. Morrison, do you want to go over those? We have a number of student um, activities. We've gone to a new protocol around approvals, and you can see the first three are um, our music students who have are moving on to play and compete at higher levels through uh, Pennsylvania. Um, Dr. Winnows, can you help me out here for PMEA? Thank you. Um, so those are the first three, and then the last one um, that we're bringing forward as a motion is our girls high school track and field um, team um, has been traveling to the College of William and Mary for a number of years for this optional uh, track and field event. Any questions about this? Uh, I think there was one uh, motion prior to this also that we didn't cover yet. B, the STEM. So we can do that next. I I'm sorry, that's right, I skipped right over it. Um, we are sending our middle school science teachers to more deeply investigate STEM through the MCIU STEMULI program. The conferences were already approved However, we're cutting a rather large check to the MCIU for the participation in the program, which will include um, Ken Small, our K-12 science coordinator, uh, Phil Vinagrata, and myself as we continue to look at STEM opportunities um, in the middle school. Any questions about this? Has this, this has started already? It will begin um, in, in next week. Next week, okay. So we already approved sending the teachers. This is just an additional. No, it's just that we're we are cutting one large check for a conference to the MCIU on behalf of all of those teachers. We did improve each individual teacher as a conference. So those okay. do we we have to approve this anyway? Uh, it may be big enough to require board action. Uh, it is a big enough cost, even yeah. though we had we had listed each teacher separately in okay. December's conferences. Um, the MCIU is billing us, and so we're requiring a board motion in so order to. In the aggregate, the right. amount reaches the, the level of board approval. Okay. Um, any other questions about that? And then we have some conferences. We have two conferences going. Um, we have uh, an elementary school teacher who's competing at children's literature. And we have uh, the cost of registration for a reading specialist at the middle school whom we asked to take an introductory whole Wilson language training. And she wasn't aware of the protocol regarding uh, remuneration. OK, so that has already happened. Okay. It is. Any other comments or questions about any of these potential motions? If not, we'll move them all forward. Okay. Um, <coughs> um, Dr. Ludwig, just a reminder, at the beginning of the meeting, you skipped announcements and communications. Oh, right. you may want to do before community. Uh, Dr. Wheeler, is there any announcements or communications? Thank you. They're not at this time. Uh, at this time, we will have community input. If anyone would like to address the committee, step to the microphone, follow the usual protocol. I get to go first this time. Uh, Ginny Vitella, Ambler. Um, I just had some questions, really. Um, and actually, my first one was that from my, my experience with sixth and seventh grade, <coughs> we're not getting real time feedback in writing. And um, I just wanted to let you know that since we actually, since I actually have a kid in each of those grades, and I know that that's hopeful looking forward to, but I don't see that happening now at all. 
Um, and uh, to answer your question, that oh, I don't see any writing with a pencil on a piece of paper. Um, and I have to say, the ready to enter my perspective, and I think maybe my children were at the time at the time where the things are getting implemented a little bit too late. But I feel like one thing that's lost during those elementary years is the spelling and the handwriting. I'm finding that in sixth and seventh grade, it's pretty pretty sad. Um, not very good, but that might just be my kid. <laughs> um, I, for the foreign language, I still don't quite, sorry Donna, I don't quite understand the explanation how going from five times a week to two times a week is good or who it's good for. Because it seems like if the kid was now, was getting five days of kind of foreign language that going to two doesn't seem good for the elementary, maybe it's for the high school student, I'm not sure. So if I could just get an understanding of that, I'd be grateful. Um, and I wondered about the star testing, if some of those patterns, um, if we considered the fact that maybe learning how to take that type of test, you know, there's a learning curve in taking that type of test, that if some of that growth is actually just the students are getting a little better handling that test online, if that's been considered in there. Um, and uh, to, to follow up on the book reading list and what we're doing for students maybe, um, that need a little more help or maybe don't have some strong supports at home. The books, book list we definitely got, um, but I'm wondering if there's something that we could be doing also like after school programs or summer programs for those children that uh, maybe their parents don't know how to look up those books online or can't get access to them or something else. That's all, thanks. Jen Kuzmin's Fort Washington. I just have one question about the um, AP, the, the courses, the um, social studies, history, and the ELA. I'm talking about detracking or why we're not, or reorganizing or what, whatever we're calling it. Um, the answer was that we don't have uh, supports in place for those students, and I'm just wondering what exactly that means by supports, if it's a staffing issue, um, just what that meant. Thank you. Seeing no other people coming to the microphone, uh, we will close community input and address the questions. Um, Ms. Vitella, thank you very much as always for your feedback and it is good to have real-time parent what's happening in the classroom um, and I do hope that there will be more work around comments while learning is unfolding. Um, to the question of handwriting, um, that's something that um, I think we could give some thought to. Uh, in terms of the world language, the PLUS class, we currently have 11th and 12th graders who have completed a third, third year of world language study who can elect to take PLUS. Um, those students walk to Fort Washington Elementary School. We currently have one section of 25 students with one teacher teaching that. We can, if we move to two sections of 25 students, we'll, have, we'll give 50 students the opportunity to walk over to uh, Fort Washington. So it actually increases the number of students who can enroll in that class. Um, so that's why we're doing um, that. In terms of supports for students in 11th grade, I think uh, Ms. Vandervick gave a very good example. It's a very substantial term paper in 11th grade. I think we have to keep in mind that we are four months into the reduction of levels, restructuring in 10th grade for English language arts. Um, and as we move into 11th grade with those students, um, there will be some students who need supports to complete that term paper. It's lengthy, it's across several um, novels, authors, short stories. Um, we're going to give students the option and recommendation that they can do that class um, through world literature and the short story study. In a short story study, writing that very complicated term paper would be across short stories instead of entire novels, and a lot of the support for writing that paper would occur during the class. Uh, trips to the media center for research, all of those important steps. Um, we can and will continue to look at possibilities for support. For example, could students in 11th grade uh, take the world literature and novel study course and be supported through a writing, couple of day a week writing course where the term paper will be written. There are staffing implications for that, and that may or may not be the 
best placement for a student in 11th grade who's attempting that work. So hopefully that answers your question. I think the other ones were mine. Um, to spelling and handwriting. Um, so spelling um, is addressed through the foundations program in kindergarten and first grade and we are moving into second grade next year. Um, rote spelling memorization is, is not um, a research-based way to teach kids to spell, but pattern assessments are included in foundations. So students learn the OT pattern, they learn words around that during the week, and then when they're given the assessment, it's novel OT words that they've never encountered before. So I am extremely confident that uh, spelling as a whole will improve as these programs. I know that it's too late for your kids, but um, at any rate, I'm very confident about that. So I, I do know that that's how you feel on that topic. Um, it's the same with um, printing. Foundations includes uh, specific printing instruction, and we have no, made no changes to the banner blows or handwriting uh, in terms of cursive instruction um, has been previously provided in the district. As far as STAR testing, some of the patterns uh, being the result of uh, students learning curve on taking the test. One of the reasons that I think it's really important when you're looking at those big screening reports is to interpret them as trends, is because absolutely, right? So a student can get better at the test. At the same time, however, because those screenings capture one day in time, student's dog might have died that morning. They may have to go to the bathroom. So their scores may come up in the red and that's not really the case. And so the students that we monitor really closely, we give that assessment multiple times so that we can get a data trend. And that's why I think the trends are positive, but you're absolutely right. On any individual student, their score could be better with practice. Their score could be worse in December because it was a bad day for them. So that's why I think trends are really important when you're looking at, at big data like that. Um, I'm glad to hear that you got the book reading list. I um, am actually very interested in how we support students who need more help. Um, Mr. McAleer has instituted a program with math this year, um, utilizing a, a neighboring university, which is exciting to see. Um, I know at the other buildings they have other kinds of programs that provide after school supports. They have reading with dogs, all kinds of things happen. At Fort and at Thomas Fitzwater, because they're Title I buildings, we do have a Title I parent night and we have Title I uh, parent meetings in those buildings so that students who are struggling readers, um, the reading specialists meet with them. We actually sign a parent compact about how we can support. That's all federally required. But I do think, um, as was mentioned earlier, the more the district can do to, to provide additional supports, the better. We want all kids to get to that middle school and high school level being successful, able to be in those highest uh, courses. So that's an ongoing goal. Um, I think that was everything. I, I think I got it. Did I miss anything? Yeah, I, th I think we've addressed all the uh, questions for tonight. Um, so that really concludes our meeting. Our next education committee meeting is Monday, February 5th, 6 o'clock in the Cardinal Room right here. Have a good evening, everyone. Dr. Lovewick, the board will move to an executive session okay. immediately. Please meet. Okay.